My beloved son. Coming up. I have the audacity to dream a little bit bigger for Lullaby. It's year two of the Lullaby Project. You are my sunshine on a rainy day. Once again, local musicians and women at Highland Mountain team up to write and record lullabies for the inmates' children. That CD be scratching, but they still play it. One of the Highland moms who left prison is back, but not as an inmate. The beacon of light. Ahead, a follow-up frontiers. Never give up. You can always get up. How one woman's lullaby journey has taken a surprising turn since she left Highland. How she's now paying it forward. Just gotta find your way. Sponsorship for Frontiers with Rhonda McBride is provided by your local Alaska Toyota dealers. Toyota, let's go places. Alaska, where there are old triumphs, but also new frontiers. With challenges as great as the state itself, but a belief that the best is yet to come. Bringing you the faces, the places, and the spirit of the last frontier. This is Frontiers with Rhonda McBride. Welcome to a follow-up Frontiers program. I'm Emily Carlson in for Rhonda McBride. Last year, we took you to the Highland Mountain Correctional Center to bring you Alaska's first lullaby project, which brought a group of local musicians and Highland moms together to write lullabies. The artist also recorded them on a CD for the inmates' children. Now, that process repeated itself this year, but also in the backdrop this year, Alaska's opioid crisis. Rhonda McBride has the story. The night brought quiet after a day of turmoil. In a 24-hour period, there had been five heroin overdoses at the prison. So the musicians brought a welcome release from the tension. The occasion for the Highland moms to hear their lullabies for the very first time. This song is in Athabascan, an Alaska Native language. Some of the words come from a song Carlene Charlie's grandmother sang to her as a child. She is overcome with joy that she can pass this on to her children. I can't wait to see you again. And while each song is different, one thing these Highland moms have in common, they're here for drug-related crimes, with addictions that not only hurt them, but their children. After all the things we've been through, you still call me mom. Kendria Husky hasn't seen her son since he was five, and although he's now 16, she's grateful the bond is still there. He still calls me mom. This is the one lullaby in which all the women join in. I interview all of the women that participate in the project. And one of the questions that I ask on the interview, what else are you doing? What other classes are you taking? To be accepted into the Lullaby Project, each woman must take part in a parenting class and other self-help programs. Inviting them into Lullaby becomes a part of the wheel, and Lullaby is just one of those spokes in the wheel. None of the women in this group were involved in the heroin overdoses, yet it's still too close. The drug epidemic is very real. Now people are more aware that this is just not something you can brush underneath the rug. We need help. Love and ways to help themselves in groups like this. It's about love, 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 love yourself. We be the hope, we be the light for the other women. And there's one woman in particular. The beacon of light. Who shines bright. This is such an amazing, um, opportunity for me to be sitting here. Sean Muese Fesonga Ina was on the inside last year and she's back again but as a teacher. This right here is going to be a bond for you and your kids because I know it did for me and my kids. That CD be scratching but they still play it. 
over and over. Sean says her lullaby helped prepare the way for her release and reunion with her kids. I've only seen you as an inmate, and now to see you out there blossoming, you know, as a mom, it's really great. Sean is a leader and she easily steps into her leadership role. And all of you are leaders in addition. And when you step into that role, you do great things. You still call me mom. One other former Highland mom, Shauna Jones, also returned to help her former inmates write songs. Shauna is five years sober. Next year, the Lullaby Project for the first time will include fathers who are serving in prison. When we come back, the birth of a lullaby. How it lives out in some surprising ways. We just heard about one of the Highland moms who is now out of prison and joined the musicians to help her former inmates write lullabies. She also recorded two of the songs on the latest lullaby CD. Rhonda McBride spent some time with her to find out more about her new life. After a few months on the job, Sean Muese Faisungaina is in line for a promotion. Always looking for the next thing to do. Front cheese third. Management says Sean has leadership skills. But last year, when she began her lullaby journey, it was a different story. Like, gentle, not too rough of a stroke. They started with a letter Sean wrote to her children. I want you to know that it is not your fault that mommy wasn't there. You are the most precious thing that I ever had in my life. Just know that you are my angels. You've said falling angels many times, right? This, this, and I'm wondering if you'd like that to be the title. They settled on angels from heaven. The chorus used that same phrase in Sean's Samoan language. Angelo my luna. My, my luna, okay. Yeah. With harmonies and instrumentation, Angels from Heaven took flight. When it came time for the debut of the CD at Hylam, Sean was so overwhelmed, it took her several minutes to recover. <sighs> and it wasn't a fake cry. But it's like I've done wrong by my kids, and now I want to do right. <laughs> now, Sean pays it forward. One woman creating a positive path for others to follow. Sean still takes it one step at a time. She tries to meet her boys after school. Three of her sons live with their father, who is now her ex-husband. She's grateful his new wife has been very supportive of her efforts to reconnect with her kids. Sean's oldest boy, Felice, was only eight when she went to prison for theft and forgery. Her meth addiction hit him the hardest. He wasn't a baby, you know, he was like, he know things, he can see things, he hear things. But most of all, he needed her. <sighs> What's it like having your mom back now? It's the best thing ever, I guess. Because at least now I get to see her and just talk to her and listen to her. And she can listen to us too. <laughs> Yeah. One of the ironies, when Sean first went to see her boys, she didn't recognize Felice. Even though he has the same eyes, he's changed a lot. She was like, who's you? I was like, I'm your son. Mm -hmm. <laughs> for Sean, these are tears of joy. This is what I've been like dying for when I was in jail. Now she lives at Hope House, a transitional housing program for inmates. So this is my scrapbook that, um, 
one of the girls did for me. Sean can't turn back the pages of time. That's why I couldn't recognize him. But she wants Felice to understand she's worked hard to change. It's a struggle every day, like trying to make the right choices. But one good choice often takes care of the rest. I study this one, this one. Sean has always called her boys her angels from heaven. Well, as it turns out, voice check. These angels can sing. I will follow him. Follow him. Follow him wherever he may go. Felice and his brothers are full of surprises. But one of the biggest of all, the boys have learned to sing her lullaby. Ilofatu. Ilofatu. La pele ina lo ufatu. Wow, what a powerful story. Sean also recorded two songs on the latest Lullaby CD. We'll bring you one of those later in our program. But first, we talk with Alaska's Commissioner of Corrections, Dean Williams, to find out how the legislature's rollback of SB 91 affects prison reform. Alaska's prison system has been under the microscope. Lawmakers just passed a bill that rolled back some of the prison reforms of Senate Bill 91. And then there's Alaska's opioid epidemic, which has added fuel to the controversy. Joining us now to talk about that is Dean Williams, Alaska's Corrections Commissioner. Thanks so much for being on the program, mm -hmm. Commissioner. Thank, thank you, Emily, for having me. Let's start with SB 54. Of course, that's the bill that replaces <coughs> SB 91. How will that affect the prison system? Well, there are, I mean, most of the reforms that are still in place in terms of what we're trying to do behind the walls, and those are the ones that are most important to me. So those things haven't changed. Um, there are some things in Senate Bill 54 that did change some of the sentencing structures, but I kind of look at that this way, is that I, those are the cards I've been dealt with. Um, my job is to make uh, reforms behind the walls, and things like, um, you know, the programs, any, like the Lullaby Project that's been going on and other things like that, um, those, are, those are the things I'm out to advance and advocate for and make changes behind the wall. So I am going to, uh, some of the things that changed in 54 are going to drive some of my population's numbers north, what I say north, by a certain amount. We're not exactly sure yet, um, but I'll have to deal with that. But I'm mostly concerned about what we do behind the walls. So I'm concerned about what's happened in 54, but I'm really mostly concerned about what we're continuing to make changes inside our own department. You've been following SB 54. Some legal experts think that a part of it could be un unconstitutional, yet the governor says he'll sign it. Will that complicate things? Uh, I don't really, <clears throat> it won't complicate it for me. Um, uh, my job, like I said, is to do what I can with the cards that I've been dealt. Um, I'm uh, everyone in that room who's making justice policy and, and revising statutes wants Im improved public safety. That's all of our jobs. And people have different ways of getting there and different focuses about that. That's the struggle and the tension in the room anytime you make any of these kind of policies. Um, but for me, that's really not going to impact. I, anytime we're increasing counts, I have to take that into account. That's going to impact what I'm doing behind the walls, of course. Um, but there's still things I'm going to do regardless of what the counts are. Let's talk the opioid epidemic. It's hit all of us so hard, especially people in the prison system. Mm -hmm. How much of that was a factor in the rollback? Well, the, the opioid epidemic is a factor in so many things. I don't know if I want to pin all of that on what the rollback was about. I don't, I, I'm not sure I'm ready to make that connection. I'll just say this about the opioid epidemic. Um, it is touching all areas of one's life. If you talk to people who have children who are uh, drug addicted, and so um, there's no place that's immune from that. And uh, behind the walls, we're not immune from it either. Um, and so the, the opioid epidemic is around the country, and it's in our state now, and the challenge is what to do about it. Speaking of the opioid epidemic at Highland Mountain Correctional, right. five overdoses in one day, four women, one who overdosed twice. How does right. that happen? Um, well, as I said, we're not immune from the problem. In fact, I would say, if anything, um, the people who are addicted outside the walls are still addicted behind the walls. And um, I, I have, we're much better now in terms of strategies about how we find out who's trafficking drugs. 
We have an entirely different system set up now. I have an internal affairs in my department that wasn't in existence when we took when I took over. Uh, we have cooperations with the FBI, the DEA, the U.S. Attorney's Office. So we're doing things quite differently. Uh, a lot of the public doesn't see that, but in terms of how our intelligence gathering and what we're doing with cases is entirely different. We just recently announced the, the U.S. Attorney's Office announced an indictment of three people. Um, that case that was just, uh, I think, announced yesterday uh, is a great example of interagency cooperation. And that doesn't sound very jazzy on one hand, but you don't make cases unless you really share information and share intelligence and strategies, and that's uh, one of the things we're doing in terms of the suppression end of things or enforcement end of things. Let's talk about the Lullaby Project. Mm -hmm. It's funded by a variety of nonprofits, so it's not funded by the state. Right. Is this increasingly important, having that nonprofit presence? Yeah, well, it's not only the importance of the nonprofits. I mean, I love this. I love these kind of projects. I love these are things uh, that I, I love going to. I love, um, I love being part of them. Uh, that's the great job of being commissioner. Um, but it's not only the nonprofits. The it's the business opportunities that I'm developing and where inmates are working. So there's a number of different angles I've taken since I've taken over to make sure that people in the public know that these are their prison systems. And this is just an, as an ours, we're not a cloistered group here of just running these places. I need everybody in this state to understand these prison systems are theirs. Um, because we need to do something about the reoffense rate and the recidivism rate of people coming out of prison. And um, the way you do that is involve others with you to lift, you know, to lift, help lift the, the heavy load. And um, so I love the nonprofit involvement in a deep way, but I also love some of the other things we're starting up too. But um, these kind of projects are just, are just excellent, and I know that they're the future for how we bring down the reoffense rate. The Lullaby Project can't save everyone, right? We <clears throat> recently learned that one of the women who participated in the program has since died of an overdose. How do we get to the root of the problem? Well, I've been looking at this really closely. Um, there's one really good thing about the law intervention and the legal system's intervention on someone who's a heroin addict. They're given a choice. And so a lot of things that the governor and everybody on the cabinet has been really focusing on is what to do now once the criminal justice system comes to play in your life if you're a heroin addict. And what other opportunities can we give you? Can we put a fork in your road? And so other states and other countries are a little bit ahead of us, but um, I just came back from a 50-state crime summit on this very same issue. And so one of the things I know is providing opportunities for people to say, yeah, I'm done. Yeah, I got my hand up. Uh, like Sean and other people that we see that um, come to us who finally say, yep, I get it. This is all bad. And making sure that they have an opportunity to stop um, and give in, putting a fork in their road. And so we're working on very hard about creating those new opportunities. And other states are too. And, and I think um, we're all learning from each other about how to attack the problem. One of the, one of the things that you see coming out of the opioid crisis that we saw in the Lullaby Project is how families are affected. It's not just the prisoner. Oh, right. It's their families too. Right. Um, talk with um, talk with a, a father or a mother of a heroin addict um, and get their story. It changes your life. It changes my life. Um, you can't help but talk to these people and know the the pain they've all been under in terms of watching their loved one go down that road. Um, I have great hope, to be quite frank, in. Um, and having those people come near me. I have, I have parents now who, who have children who have, who have died of heroin addiction who are, who are close to me. Um, they pray for me, they pray for our department, um, and I need all those people near me, to be quite frank, and so I think you have to see it from many different scopes of view. We all, we all want public safety. I don't want my car broken in, my house broken into, um, but most of these people, uh, except for the heroin addiction or other addiction, are you and I and talk to their family members, they are you and I. There are some people in prison, by the way, who stay in prison for a very long time, believe me. Um, but there's a lot of people who people don't understand that these heroin addicts are your family members. And, and until one of your family members becomes a heroin addict, it changes everything in your life. And so um, it's changed my perspective because it's far more real and I see it, of course, every day as commissioner. You're the, you were the superintendent at the McLaughlin Youth Facility. Do you run into inmates today that you saw there? <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, yes, I do sometimes. Um, and it's interesting um, when that happens. I, um, we knew even in the juvenile system, even the adult system, you're not gonna get to everybody. But 
at some particular time, you have to give people a second and third and a fourth chance to make a change. That doesn't mean you don't hold them accountable. Of course you do. Uh, you're in prison, we have your freedom. But once we do have your freedom, then now you have another choice to make today. Um, and if you ever talk to anybody who's a heroin addict, I talk to a smoker, an ex-smoker. How many times do they take before they finally quit? And so how many more times do you need? Do you need another chance, another time after that? And finally, many do when given an opportunity to. Some don't, and we can't reach everyone. But our goal is to provide meaningful opportunities for them to get a second, and a third, and a fourth chance. The Lullaby Project next year would like to include men. What do you think about that? Uh, why not, right? I mean, the, um, <clears throat> there are many uh, men in prison who have children as well. And there are many men in prison who realize they um, want to make a life change. And so I'm looking for all those opportunities. I think we have to break down all those walls. So I've opened, I'm op I continue to open up the facilities as much as possible to welcome people in, to be part of the solution, um, because we can't fix this. Uh, I know that I have great staff, by the way, who, um, but they all recognize, too, that we can't fix this on our own. And so absolutely, great idea. Can't wait to see what they come up with. Right? Exactly, exactly, yeah. All right, Commissioner, yeah. thanks so much for yeah. being here and thanks. chatting with us. Thanks for having me. Finally, we have one more note on the Lullaby Project. It's run by the Keys to Life program. If you're interested in finding out more or buying any of the CDs to support the project, you can go to keystolifealaska.com for more information. We leave you now with one of the songs on the Lullaby CD performed by a woman who was once inside but is now on the outside paying it forward. Thanks so much for watching. See you next week. You can always get up.